Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for the um, opportunity to be here. Uh, I, um, in my role, get the chance to speak at a few churches around the place, and I always count a privilege just to come and just to be a part of God's people gathering and worshiping and, and fellowshipping together. So, thank you to Ron. Uh, I've met Ron a few times. I know Ron, and um, I don't know the rest of you. That's okay. I'm sure we'll have a cup of tea later and um, learn each other's name as well. So. Uh, my role, just before we get into the to the word, my role in Churches of Christ in Queensland, I work in our mission team out of our, out of our head office, and I look after a team of people who are, in simple terms, trying to help us as a whole movement of people um, be kingdom people, really. And so, I don't know if you know much about Churches of Christ, um, you're sitting in one this morning, but we also have a whole bunch of other things that we do right across Queensland. So. We have about three and a half thousand staff who work in things like our seniors living um, team. So a lot of aged care and retirement living villages, community care workers. We have people who work in our children, youth and families, which is all of our foster care work. So we have an office right here in Caboolture, uh, for example. And we're the largest provider of out-of-home care in Queensland. So you think about all of the people, or all of the young people, children who aren't able to live with their families, they get looked after by various agencies and organisations and we do that more than anyone else in Queensland. So that's a fairly significant work. Um, we also have a, a housing uh, organisation or company that does work in social and affordable housing. So one of only two not-for-profit tier one housing providers in the state. Uh, and so that does a lot of work providing homes for people um, who, you know, for whatever reason, um, have struggled through life. So we do all of those things, and of course we have all of our uh, 60 or 70 odd churches as well, all over Queensland. And the big vision really of our movement is to say that all of that stuff that we do, whether it's seniors living or looking after children or providing a house, uh, all of that really is a kingdom activity, that we think actually that Jesus would be given a big tick to a worker who turns up to a young person who's vulnerable uh, and at risk in their family and can't live with their family anymore um, and needs another safe place to live. <laughs> we think Jesus would actually give that tick as he would give providing a home for somebody a tick. The first piece of housing work that we did as Churches of Christ in Queensland was in Zillmere, uh, well over a hundred years ago when that little small local church found some people who basically were homeless. And so they banded together and they brought a house, that church, so that those people could have somewhere to live. Now we've got a big company that does housing stuff all over the place and rah, 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 but really that's where it began. That out of the compassion of Christ and his people, that people were cared for. And so all around Queensland, my job is to bring our church leaders to sit with our housing or our seniors or our children, youth and families leaders to sit together and ask, what, is it, what does it look like to bring the light of Christ into this community? What does it look like for Christ's name to be proclaimed? What does it look like for a house to be provided or uh, for a, a child to be looked after? And we want to do all of that in a way that is true to Jesus and, and honest. And so I get to lead those conversations in various places around Queensland, which is a great opportunity and a great job. So before I did that, I was the senior pastor uh, at a church in Brackenridge, at Brackenridge Baptist Church, and our family is still uh, still connected and still involved there, so that's that's home to me, 20, 20 minutes down the highway uh, in Brackenridge, uh, closer to the big smoke, the Caboolture. Um, but um, I spent um, a long time ministering and, and leading in the church context um, down there. So for me, uh, I love being able to open up God's Word as well and um, have a look at what that actually means for us and calls us to be. Mm -hmm. So how about we jump straight in? Is that alright? Mm -hmm. yeah. Matthew chapter 5, I'm going to read a little bit to you. If you've got your Bible there, you can read along. Uh, again, this will be a well-known passage and you um, would have read it um, many times probably or heard it many times. But let me read it to you and then I want to just unpack it a little bit for us this morning. You've heard it said, this is Jesus speaking of course in the um, Sermon on the Mount, that well-known uh, passage of scripture from Matthew 5 and 6. Uh, Jesus says, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, 
Don't use violence to resist evil. Instead, when someone hits you on the right cheek, turn the other one toward him. And when someone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your cloak as well. And when someone forces you to go one mile, go a second one with him. Give to anyone who asks you and don't refuse someone who wants to borrow from you. You've heard it said, love your neighbour and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, that that way you will be children of your Father in heaven. After all, he makes the sun rise on the bad and the good alike and sends rain both on the upright and on the unjust. So this morning I want to talk about uh, the way of Jesus. Um, often we think about a lot about who Jesus is and we've spent a great time this morning worshipping him, our great God. Uh, we've joined around the table and, and celebrated a communion together. Uh, the death and the resurrection of Jesus, the one who laid down his life for us that we might by his grace, be saved and find a relationship with God. Um, that's, that's the core of who we are and what we actually believe. But there is also this idea that Jesus has a particular way that he calls us to be and to live. It's not just what we believe or even what we do, but how we go about that. We know this from all sorts of examples, don't we? I was thinking... Um, just about great Australian examples of people who understand it's not just what you do, but the way we go about it is important. A, a recent example of this is the great Australian footballer Jonathan, Jonathan Thurston. Now, Jonathan Thurston is one of the best rugby league players ever to play the game. People will wax lyrical about this um, young boy from Brisbane who was too small and always told he would never make it, he was too small, he was too small. He was too small. But we know him, not as this small kid from Brisbane, but as one of the great rugby league players for Queensland and Australia and for the Cowboys. And if you turn on your television any time in the last 15 years and watch rugby league, you probably saw Jonathan Thurston running around scoring tries or kicking goals or helping, other, helping his team win. Because he, he is top of the tree um, when it comes to rugby, rugby league players. Now he's just retired, of course. But one of the great things about Jonathan Thurston is not just his ability, but the way he went about being a great rugby league player. And so when Jonathan Thurston would kick a goal, um, you know, they have the kicking tees, those little plastic things they put the ball off. When, it, when you kick a goal, that tee sort of, you know, rolls off. It used to be that there would be a ball boy or a servant of some kind that would come and pick up that tee. So Jonathan Thurston decided that he would pick it up for them. <laughs> so you get this little kid running on whose job is to go and collect the kicking tee. And Jonathan Thurston races off and finds it wherever it is and he picks it up and he leans down and he gives it to the little boy and gives him a pat on the head. Now every player does that. Five years ago, no one did it. It's not just that he's a great goal kicker, it's the way that he goes about it. At the end of the game, Jonathan Thurston takes off his headgear. You've probably seen this on television. And he goes and finds a youngster in the crowd. And he gives him his headgear. It's not that he just runs around in the field and does uh, football better than most other players who have ever played the game. It's the way that he goes about it. Some of you may not remember the first premiership that Jonathan Thurston won was with the Canterbury Bulldogs many, many years ago. And he came off the bench. And the reason he was included in the game is because the great Steve Price, who was currently captain of the club, was injured and he couldn't take his place in the team for the grand final. I don't know if you remember this. And the Canary Bulldogs win. They win the grand final. And immediately after the grand final, Jonathan Thurston goes up to Steve Price and he gives him his premiership ring. He gives it to the captain who, who couldn't play that day. It's not just that he was a great footballer. It was the way that he went about being a great footballer that has stood out to many of us as who have watched him throughout his career. And so now he has a deep respect. He has a deep respect in the Aboriginal community of which he is a voice for. He has a deep respect much broader than football because we know him not only as a great playmaker but as a great person and as a great leader. As followers of Jesus, it's not just what we believe, and it's not 
more than just what we might even do as followers of Jesus. Church of Christ does a lot of great stuff. We do great aged care and seniors living. We do great looking after kids. We do great providing housing. It's not just what we do as followers of Jesus, but the way in which we go about doing that. That is really important. And when we read the words of Jesus, it's not just the story about what he did, but the way that he went about doing it and who he calls us to be as followers of him. Because we're not just believers in him, are we? Absolutely, we are. <laughs> we are believers in him. We're not just that, we are also followers of him. And so I want to leave you this morning um, with this scripture and just with a, two or three insights in what it means to be a follower of Jesus, the way that we carry ourselves as people who claim his name. Now we could have chosen a whole bunch of scriptures, I'm not saying this is the only bit that we could have chosen, but this is one place that we can turn to um, to answer that question. So Jesus says, you've heard it said, uh, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. He's kind of talking about when we come up against people or come up against situations where, where it's not easy. You know, we might be up against an adversary or an enemy or, or a, a place of life where we kind of test it a little bit. Because when things are going well, you know, things are going well. <laughs> when things are going well, the best of us comes out. This comes out naturally. Because we're not under pressure, we're not stressed, we're not reacting in any way. But when we get put under a bit of pressure, when we come up against an enemy, when, when an adversary comes against us, or when maybe life is just a bit tough, or stressed out, or not rolling on is just nice and easy for us, then our true colours shine through. And Jesus says, you're not to hear eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You know, give it as it comes to you. But I'd say to you that it's a different one. If someone slaps you on the cheek, <coughs> someone hits you on the right cheek, sorry, Jesus says, turn the other one toward him. What does this mean? Well, we sort of take it to mean that Jesus is saying, well, you know, just, oh, I just lie down and let people walk all over you. You know, turn the other cheek. If someone's kind of slapping you around, just kind of make it a bit easier for them. Uh, in Jesus' day, when if someone hit you on the right cheek, um, it was with the back of their right hand. Your left hand was um, your toilet hand. So you didn't really do that much with that. But your right hand, for someone to hit you on the right cheek, they would use the back of their right hand. So imagine I'm hitting you on your, the right cheek. I'm doing that. And the point is that, that that's actually a derogatory action. So Jesus is using an illustration here that's not at all about physical violence. He's not saying that people are slapping you around. The point is, he's saying if people are doing that to you, they're using their back of their hand, which was actually a put there. It was actually a statement of saying, I'm, I'm, I'm superior to you. It was actually a way of saying to someone, you are not my equal. Think of maybe a master um, slapping a slave with the back of their hand, or maybe... Um, Maybe someone, uh, an older person, kind of putting down a child who had no status in that time. It was a way of saying, you're beneath me. You're, you, you're below me. I'm not even going to slap you with the, with the palm of my hand. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat you with no dignity at all and suggest that somehow you're down there and I'm up here like that. Jesus is saying, if someone is going to treat you with that amount of disrespect and try and put you down and say that they're not even equal to you, then offer them the other cheek. What that forces them to do is hit you with an open hand. Not that disrespectful thing. If you're going to slap me on the cheek, in other words, keep the same, then you will do it as an equal. This is actually a statement of defiance, if you like. What Jesus is actually saying is that, that uh, you need to insist that people will treat you with a sense of equality. We're the same here. Someone's going to run you down. It's not a matter of just rolling over and letting people treat you as if you're, uh, you know, some sort of rubbish or just to be discarded or trampled all over, slapped around. No, what Jesus is saying, 
If, 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 if someone comes to you and suggests that somehow they're superior to you, that, that they're above you, that they can treat you with disrespect and disdain, what our response ought to be as followers of him is not to respond with some kind of a get back action, but to insist that that person, regardless of who they are or what they think about themselves and you, that that person is actually your equal. I've got a, um, a, a person in my team, and he's an Aboriginal leader, and he's a fantastic person. Um, uh, a leader that I have significant respect for. He would be one of the most significant Christian Aboriginal leaders in our country. And he works in our team, which is, um, which is amazing. And he's leading a church at the moment. Uh, he's doing, got some broader ministry that he's doing with us. And, one day we were uh, going to Mackay for a, a series of meetings that we had. And so we flew into Mackay and uh, we were going to pick up our hire car from the rental company. We just had a corporate rental thing and he just kind of turned up and say, there's a booking and, it's, and it was booked in his name. And he had great difficulty getting the rental thing sorted out. I mean, I find car rental things rather archaic and, and slow and, you know, which which business still uses a dot matrix printer to print out stuff? You know those old things with the holes on the side of the paper and it turns through? Every time I go to a car rental place, we're using a printer from the 1980s and I'm going, well, why are we doing that? It's rather weird. But he, he was having great difficulty getting his rental car. I was just going to jump in with him. And eventually he said, oh, I, they need you to put your license on it. And I thought, like, look at Anyway, so I pulled out my license and gave him my license. And eventually we got it all sorted out. And I was walking away because I, I ended up renting it in my name. And he said, did you see the look on that guy's face? I said, what do you mean? He said, he didn't want to give me the car because I'm an original. What are you talking about? He said, he said you probably don't even notice it, but he, he was not up for me renting the car. So I gave the keys to him and said, well, you can, you, the car's yours. <laughs> I don't care what he thinks. You can have the car. He needed it for longer than I did anyway, because he was sticking around. Sometimes, um, sometimes we come across this scenario where people will want to put you down. That was like a back of the hand slap. What we have to do is learn to throw our shoulders back, not in an arrogant, retaliating kind of way, but just insist and understand that regardless of our station in life, regardless of the position that we hold or don't hold, regardless of how people may or may not see us, there is this fundamental idea that Jesus has, that as his creation, that we have a sense of equality as human beings. And that is the way of him. So we ought not to put others down, but we ought to let others also understand we're on the same level here. We're on the same page. Does that make sense? Okay, the second thing Jesus says is when someone wants you to sue you and take your shirt, let them have your cloak as well. Again, when you read this, you think, oh, this just sounds like someone's, you know, suing you and so just let them walk all over you. Just let lie down and let them do whatever they like. Now, if they're suing you for that, we'll just double up and give them everything. Um, again, the context and the picture of this little saying of Jesus is that in, uh, in the, the law of the land and of the day, and particularly in the history of Israel, the cloak was your outside garment. And that, the, there was a sense in which the cloak was a sacred garment or um, was kind of the last thing that you ever gave away. So you'd have your shirt underneath it and then imagine a big, thick, heavy cloak that you wore on top. And that cloak was yours, and it was yours no matter what. And the reason is, is that if you got to the point where you had nothing left, at least you would be warm at night in your cloak. That was literally the concept. And so someone might sue you for all sorts of things, but they were by law, go to Exodus 22, I think it is, not allowed to sue you or take your cloak. Because last resort, at least you would be able to stay warm at night in your cloak. 
So imagine, um, imagine a scenario where you lived in, um, in ancient Israel or wherever, and someone, um, you were, a, you know, you were a relatively poor person, maybe, and you had to go and visit family in a neighbouring village. And so you went to a wealthier neighbour and you said, can I borrow your donkey? My family is sick and I need to go and visit them. Uh, it's a really important trip and it'll be much quicker and easier if I had some transport. Can I borrow your donkey? I will leave my cloak with you as like some collateral. And your know, wealthy neighbour agrees and then you go off on the donkey to the next town to visit your sick family and then you're returning later in the day from your visit and it's getting towards dark and as you're entering you can see sort of the lights of your village off in the distance and you're coming up to this town and then a wild animal jumps out and frightens the donkey and the donkey bucks and you fall off and the donkey runs away frightened by the wild animal well, night time is falling, the wild animals are around. Rather than trying to round up the donkey, which would probably be impossible, you decide that you just hightail it for home. And so you head into town and you come to the person who um, you lent the donkey from, borrowed the donkey from, and you have to come and tell the story. Now, the law says that that, that person must give your cloak back, even though you haven't got the donkey of his that you. Borrow. And the reason he must give your cloak back is that because regardless of anything else, you must have your cloak to stay warm at night. That was just the law. That's how it worked. So Jesus says, well, if someone is suing you for your shirt, give him your cloak as well. So imagine a court scene in Israel, in the public square, where you've got the elders sitting around the edge. And in that scene, there is someone suing you for your shirt. Now, if they're suing you for your shirt, it probably means that you've got nothing else left. So in other words, they are literally su suing you for the last thing that you have. The last thing they can legally sue you for, which is your shirt, your undergarment. So imagine standing around in a public court and you're being sued for the last thing that you have, and the picture is, Jesus says, well, if they're going to sue you for the last thing you have, give it to them, which is really your cloak. And then you'll be standing, completely broken and naked in a public court, and everybody will be able to see what's going on. So he doesn't say, well, if someone's trying to sue you, and have a go at you, then figure out how you can get back at them, and lie awake at night, and Imagine the retaliation. You could counter sue, or you could do that, or you could run away, or you could do it. So it doesn't do that. If, some, if there is a sense of injustice when you're being taken for your very last cent, and it's not right, the way to deal with that is just to let everybody see it. Tell the story. Don't fight back. Don't retaliate. Don't get nasty. Don't look for ways to undermine and attack and, and cast aspersions on the other person. Just let people see the injustice for what it is. And then the third thing um, Jesus says is, if someone forces you to go one mile, go a second one with them. Now, of course, this, um, this picture is about a, a Roman soldier. So in Jesus' name, of course, Rome ruled over Palestine. We all know those stories from reading the scriptures. We, we know that Rome was the dominant um, empire of, of the day. And uh, we had Pilate and other local sort of authorities who were ruling over various parts of Palestine and Israel. But there were Roman soldiers marching around. And the reason they marched around is because, you know, they were... I don't know, thousands of miles away from Rome, the centre of power in the world at that time, and they needed to be able to keep various parts of the empire under control. There were always little, you know, little revolutions sparking up here or there, you know, trying to overthrow, trying to imagine that Israel actually was God's people and He had given them this land and it shouldn't be Rome or anybody ruling over us, and so there would be kind of these little rebellions, and so soldiers would march around. They would be physically present. And they would be there to enforce the rule of Rome 
and to let everybody know who was in charge. And that was Caesar. And so the rule was, and this was actually a coded rule, is that if a soldier could force a civilian person to carry their gear, their kit, for one mile. So imagine these soldiers are walking around, it's hot, it's dusty, and they're thirsty, and they've got a bit of a power trick going on, and so they would haul someone maybe off the street and say, carry my kit for me. And the law was that they had to carry their kit for one mile. Now, if I'm an Israelite person, you know, who, who knows my history and my story, if I'm a, if I'm a good Jewish lad who, who believes that God has given me this land to live in, that it's our land, and that my ancestors were promised by God that this would be our land. If I'm a good Jewish boy who knows that story and knows that the Roman occupiers aren't the legitimate rulers in this place, if a soldier comes to me and says, carry my kit for the next mile, well then I would carry that kit because you kind of had to. But I carry it one mile and not an inch further. You carry it for a mile, you get to the mile, you'd probably drop it on the ground and kick dust on it as some sort of act of defiance saying, well you might be able to force me to carry it a mile, but there is no way I am carrying it any further, you Roman man. That would be the attitude, wouldn't it? Why would, why would you go out of your way to look after the oppressing Roman forces any more than you had to? Only you do it because you were just forced to, but you wouldn't. You wouldn't carry an inch further. Jesus said, if someone, if someone says, take my kit for a mile, take it for two. Wow. Wow. This is not this is not someone saying, oh, if your best mate says, you know, can you give us a hand for an hour? help them out for two hours. No, this is, this is when your oppressing Roman army says, can you take my kit for a mile and you take it an extra mile. Wow, that is extraordinary generosity. Because most times, when we're confronted with people who are our adversary, our enemy, they've annoyed us, they've outright done something to us, when, when I'm confronted with people like that in my life, my reflex response is to do what I have to do to interact with them if I have to interact with them, but basically avoid them. But this idea of being radically generous in a way that doubles down on what they need, that's just mind blowing. That's remarkable. Have a think about the people in your life who annoy you, who might be considered to be your adversary or your enemy, those who have done something to you that have, has really ticked you off. Maybe it's somebody in your family that you just can't actually get rid of because they're in your family and they just keep doing things to frustrate you. Imagine living in a way that actually is extraordinary and radically generous to that. The way of Jesus is just as important as the what of Jesus. And this little group of believers here in Kabulcha, which is a fantastic little church, um, I count it a real privilege to be able to just sit here and worship this morning, to eat and drink around the Lord's table with you. This little group of people in Kabulcha Church of Christ are a group of people who believe in Jesus and what he's about and what he's done, but we are also a group of people who are called to live in the way of Jesus. And that means insisting that, that we are actually people of equality. There's no one who's superior to anyone else 
here. There might be people with different positions and different responsibilities and all of that stuff. I'm not saying that, we, that, that that doesn't exist, but in terms of our fundamental human relationships, eh, we're just equal. And we figure out our plans of retribution. We just want to tell the story and expose it so that everybody can see what injustice looks like. And if we meet an adversary of some kind and we have to do something for them, we want to be the kind of people that would figure out how do we be doubly generous to those people? Because, Jesus says, this kind of living will show others that we are children of our Father in Heaven who makes the rain fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. This kind of living is actually the kind of way that the Father is related to you and I. Just with an extravagant generosity and love. With grace, with patience, with a willingness to forgive, with an unquestioned love that says, the lowest of the low in the eyes of some people are just as important as the highest of the high. That's the way our Father in Heaven sees each of us. And so it's not surprising then that Jesus would call us to live in a way that is true to the one that we've worshipped and given our allegiance to this morning. So I want to encourage you with those words, with those ideas. I know there's a bit of a challenge in there, isn't there? <laughs> Whenever I read that, I go, oh, Jesus, how, how am I going to do that? I could probably think of 10 ways this week that I haven't done that. So I know there's a bit of a challenge in there, but I also want to use that as an encouragement to us that we are people of the Christ. We're believers. We're followers. We're recipients of His grace, but we are also actors in His play, which means we have to live and be in a way that is true to Him. And we are. I don't even know you, but my hunch is that you guys get that. You intuitively get that. And you want to be like that. And so I want to encourage you on that this morning. A little call to be people who live in the way of Jesus. Can I pray for you? And then I'll get Ron to come back and finish out our time together. Father, thank you that uh, that you love us. <laughs> that we, when we get on the wrong side of you, you respond with grace and with forgiveness and finding a way to restore. Thank you for that. We've already spent time this morning just drinking deeply of your grace. <laughs> we thank you for that. We've spent time singing of your greatness and of your love for us and, and we just drink that in, we just soak that in. As your children we need that, we need to be reminded of it. Our souls get lifted and refilled in a way when we gather around this table and, and, um, and, and share our belief, uh, express our love. So we thank you for that. So we thank you Jesus again for the laying down of your life for your victory and resurrection, for all that, that means for us. The hope that it brings, the joy that it brings, the true life that it brings in you. And I just want to ask, Spirit, that as we ponder on these things and on this scripture, I want to ask that you'll help us to be children of the Father, those who live in a way that is true to Jesus, in a way that he's called us to live. And we confess again our inadequacy of this. In our own strength, we just can't do that. But Spirit, by your transforming power, we ask that we will be children of the Father in the way of Jesus. That we might live and act and be genuinely followers of Jesus. So encourage us, I pray. Challenge us where we need it. If we've been challenged this morning in Spirit, I pray that that challenge will rest and not go away. If that is if that is your work, then do your work in our midst, I pray. But also encourage us, leave us not downtrodden 
or feeling guilty in any way, but uplifted and encouraged by who you've made us to be and who you're calling us to be. And I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thanks for